This video shows various terrestrial invertebrates that I found in the woods near my house. My reason for filming these invertebrates was to improve my knowledge about what kinds of invertebrates live in the woods and to share this with viewers. This is important information because insects and other invertebrates experience significant suffering in nature during their short lives and I favor policies that reduce the numbers of these animals who are born without their consent into lives that will soon end with painful deaths. A better understanding of invertebrate populations and how they vary with land cover type can help us better favor land uses that give rise to fewer suffering invertebrates. I don't normally walk in the woods because doing so crushes lots of invertebrates in the soil which may cause extreme pain, especially to those invertebrates who are half crushed and die slowly. However, I thought that this cost would be worth it for the insight that I could glean from looking at invertebrates in the woods. Of course, we can see videos of invertebrates on nature channels and YouTube, but often those videos depict exotic locations, such as the rainforest, and focus on the most exciting parts of invertebrate lives. In contrast, this video shows a fairly representative sample of all the invertebrates that I found in an ordinary woods, with the animals engaged in their normal activities. One exception to this last point is that the invertebrates shown here may in some cases be moving to escape the light of my microscope camera, and in some cases they may be running away when I've lifted up detritus that they were hiding under. But other than that, the invertebrates shown here are pretty representative of bugs that live in the woods. By the way, if you do go out into the woods, which as I mentioned, I don't recommend because it crushes insects, be sure to check yourself for ticks afterwards to reduce your chance of getting Lyme disease. The woods shown here is near Albany, New York, USA. Filming was done on 9 August 2016, around noontime. The day was pretty hot and dry. I think it hadn't rained much for a few days. This was significant because I found that basically all the bugs in the woods, except for maybe some spiders and flying insects, were located in the wettest parts of the woods, such as under leaves in low-lying areas or around the edges of tree stumps. I assume this is both because invertebrates need water in their diets, as well as because water is where fungal and bacterial decomposition happen the fastest, and many invertebrates eat fungi and bacteria. So based on this observation, it seems that water is an important growth limiting factor for invertebrates, at least in the short run. However, I conjecture that food availability, i.e. the presence of organic vegetation, must be the main long-term growth limiting factor for decomposer populations as a whole, because if that weren't the case, we'd expect organic detritus to keep piling up on decomposed, since food would be generated for decomposers faster than it could be eaten. I think this may be a millipede, since millipedes have two pairs of legs on each body segment, while centipedes have only one pair. I found it on a pile of detritus next to the trail in the woods. According to Wikipedia, quote, most millipedes are detritivores and feed on decomposing vegetation, feces, or organic matter mixed with soil. They often play important roles in the breakdown and decomposition of plant litter. Estimates of consumption rates for individual species range from 1 to 11 percent of all leaf litter depending on species and region, and collectively millipedes may consume nearly all the leaf litter in a region. The leaf litter is fragmented in the millipede gut and excreted as pellets of leaf fragments, algae, fungi, and bacteria, which facilitates decomposition by the microorganisms. Where earthworm populations are low in tropical forests, Millipedes play an important role in facilitating microbial decomposition of the leaf litter. End quote. In contrast, this is a centipede, since it has one pair of legs per body segment. 
I found it hiding under a piece of bark in a decaying log. Sadly, centipedes have to eat other animals for food. According to Wikipedia, quote, centipedes have a wide geographical range where they even reach beyond the Arctic Circle. They are found in an array of terrestrial habitats from tropical rainforests to deserts. Within these habitats, centipedes require a moist microhabitat because they lack the waxy cuticle of insects and arachnids, therefore causing them to rapidly lose water. Accordingly, they are found in soil and leaf litter, under stones and dead wood, and inside logs. Centipedes are among the largest terrestrial invertebrate predators, and often contribute significantly to the invertebrate predatory biomass in terrestrial ecosystems." End quote. Here you can see a stump that had a spider's web in the hollow center. Sadly, a dead moth was trapped in the spider's web. The leaf litter and soil surface contain springtails, like this, as well as mites, like these. I dug a few centimeters into the soil, but didn't find any invertebrates further down than at the surface, perhaps because the soil was pretty dry and didn't have a lot of undecomposed organic matter. The woods contained many mosquitoes, including this one that was biting my hand. I blew on it to get it to stop biting without injuring it. In general, it's bad to feed mosquitoes because a blood meal allows females to lay eggs and thereby force more mosquitoes to be born into short lives. There were a lot of these bugs, which I think are wood lice. These are crustaceans in the order Isopoda. According to Wikipedia, quote, living in a terrestrial environment, wood lice breathe through trachea-like lungs in their paddle-shaped hind legs, pleopods, called pleopodal lungs. Wood lice need moisture because they rapidly lose water by excretion and through their cuticle, and so are usually found in damp, dark places, such as under rocks and logs. They are usually nocturnal and are detritivores, feeding mostly on dead plant matter." End quote. This page reports, quote, "...wood lice thrive in a temperate climate and in damp to wet surroundings, where you may find hundreds of them in a single square meter. In loose, sandy soils, on the other hand, they dry out so quickly that you'll only find a few or none at all. The females carry their babies between their legs in a brood pouch. When the babies are ready to leave after four to six weeks, they wriggle until the pouch is torn open, and they all fall out. The young woodlice can already look after themselves at this stage, although they have to eat the feces of adult woodlice to boost microbial activity in their gut. Without microbial enzymes, woodlice can eat leaves but not digest them. End quote. This study about woodlice has the following abstract. Quote, Population parameters, mortality of females, reproductive success, longevity of juveniles, of the common woodlouse, were examined with respect to the influence of varying leaf litter attributes, pH level, microbial cellulase activity, microbial dehydrogenase activity, protein content, nitrogen content, water content, tannin content, total phenol content, and toughness of the leaves. These attributes were combined by using principal component analysis. We obtained three principal components, PC, that were defined as acidification, microorganisms, and tree species. The PCs explained 85% of the variance of leaf litter attributes. The PC acidification mainly influenced the mortality of females, while the longevity of juveniles showed significant correlation to the PC microorganisms. The PC tree species showed no influence on the observed population parameters, 
indicating that the leaf litter species itself had no direct influence on the population parameters of the common woodlouse. The reproductive success of females could not be explained by either of the PCs, but was influenced by cellulolytically active microorganisms. From these results, we conclude that acidification and reduced microbial activity in the field will cause a decrease in population density of the common woodlouse." End quote. As I was leaving the woods, I saw dog poop on the trail. A few insects were buzzing around it, including this fly. In the rest of this video, I'll show many more invertebrates that I found in the woods, most of which I can't identify precisely. If you have ideas on their classifications, let me know in the comments. Now I'll read some further general information about forest decomposition. This page says, quote, in a live tree, only a thin layer of wood and bark grow and transport water and nutrients from roots to leaves. A dead tree teems with life, insects, fungi, bacteria, and other organisms. Biologist Mark Harmon of Oregon State University, OSU, also known as Dr. Death for his scientific interest in forest mortality, is taking part in a 200-year-long study to monitor the decomposition of trees. Beetles foster decomposition through the fungal spores they track deep into the logs, says Harmon. The fungi use the toughest parts of the wood as food. In doing so, they help release nutrients into the soil. End quote. This excellent article says, quote, the detritivore community includes beetles and their larvae, flies and maggots, the larvae of flies, wood lice, fungi, slime molds, bacteria, slugs and snails, millipedes, springtails, and earthworms. The primary decomposers of most dead plant material are fungi. Dead leaves fall from trees and herbaceous plants collapse to the ground after they have produced seeds forming a layer of litter on the soil surface. The litter layer can be quite substantial in volume, with the litter fall in a Scots pine forest estimated to be between 1 and 1 1.5 tons per hectare per year, while that in temperate deciduous forests is over 3 tons per hectare per year. The litter is quickly invaded by the hyphae of fungi, the white thread-like filaments that are the main body of a fungus. The mushrooms that appear on the forest floor, mostly in late summer and autumn, are merely the fruiting bodies of the fungus. The hyphae draw nourishment from the litter, enabling the fungi to grow and spread, while breaking down the structure of the dead plant material. Bacteria also play a part in this process, as do various invertebrates, including slugs and snails, springtails, and, as the decay becomes more advanced, earthworms. In a forest, the rate of decomposition depends on what the dead plant material is. The rate of decay is also determined by how wet the material is. In general, the wetter it is, the faster it breaks down, while in dry periods or dry climates, the organic matter becomes desiccated and many detritivores, such as fungi and slugs and snails, are inactive, so the decomposition process becomes prolonged. In contrast to the softer tissues of herbaceous plants, the fibers of trees and other woody plants are much tougher and take a longer time to break down. Fungi are still mostly the first agents of decay, and there are many species that grow in dead wood. The growth of the fungal hyphae within the wood helps other detritivores, such as bacteria and beetle larvae, to gain access. The fungi feed on the cellulose and lignin, converting those into their softer tissues, which in turn begin to decompose when the fungal fruiting bodies die. As the wood becomes more penetrated and open, through, for example, the galleries produced by beetle larvae, it becomes wetter, and this facilitates the next phase of decomposition. Invertebrates such as wood lice and millipedes feed on the decaying wood, 
and predators and parasites, such as robber flies and ichneumon wasps, will also arrive to feed on beetles and other invertebrates. For trees such as birch, the wood becomes very wet and rotten and falls apart quite easily after a few years. Earthworms and springtails are often seen at this stage when the decomposing wood will soon become assimilated into the soil and they can reach high densities. The biomass of earthworms in broad-leafed forests in Europe has been estimated at up to one ton per hectare. The wood of Scots pine, however, has a high resin content, which makes it much more resistant to decay, and it can take several decades for a pine log to decompose fully. End quote. This page says, quote, Downwood has a high pore volume and thus can serve as moisture reservoirs and provide persistent microsites that aid in forest recovery after a prolonged drought or fire. For example, in one study in southwest Oregon, down logs provided considerable rooting and mycorrhizal activity, and mean moisture content was 25 times greater than mean soil moisture. To a limited extent, ectomycorrhizae in downwood can break down lignins and convert nutrients, including phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, manganese, and sodium, into forms usable by insects, mollusks, and mammals. Although some ectomycorrhizal fungi have this lignin-degrading capacity, it is probably not much compared to decomposer fungi which is also found in decomposing down wood, including that of Douglas fir." End quote. This study is titled Decomposer Invertebrate Populations in U.S. Forest Biomes. The introduction says, quote, Decomposition as an ecosystem process is affected by microflora and invertebrates in a synergistic manner. The microflora are capable of accomplishing decomposition, albeit slowly, in the absence of the invertebrate animals, and typically are responsible for more than 90% of the CO2 evolved in forest decomposition. The invertebrates are known to stimulate microbial respiration, possibly by improvement of substrate through fragmentation, chemical as well as physical changes, or regulation of growth phases." End quote. The study examined invertebrate densities in various forests, and here are some of the results. Quote, Populations of decomposer invertebrates are not static, but may vary as much as fourfold on an annual basis. The range of variability is not constant between ecosystem types, and consequently, annual means offer the best ground for comparison. By first comparing the so-called natural systems, it can be seen that the densities found in the eastern cove hardwood forest are quite similar to the western Douglas fir forest. The oak forest is similar when corrected for exclusion of soil forms. Net primary productivities do not differ significantly among the three. And presumably, annual decomposition approaches net primary productivity, since each represents the final stage of the local sear. Successional stages, including plantations, attain maximum productivities within a relatively short period, but standing crop increases well beyond the attainment of maximum productivity. This implies that decomposition is less than net production during the development of a forest, and if there is less to decompose, one would expect fewer organisms to decompose it. This is exactly what is seen in comparing the Douglas fir plantation to the mature 450-year-old stand. At almost all samplings, populations at Cedar River were approximately 50% of those at the H.J. Andrews Forest. It has been said that litter decomposes at a rate directly related to the number of invertebrate animals in the litter and underlying soil. Our results would tend to rephrase the statement to say that the numbers of invertebrate animals present is dependent upon the amount and decomposability of the litter present. Seasonal distribution of decomposer invertebrates varied among sites according to local climactic differences. Within the southeastern states, invertebrate populations 
tended to be bimodal, with lows during late winter when the soil was both cold and saturated, and in late summer when sustained high evapotranspiration had reduced soil and litter moistures to an annual minimum. End quote. The summary and conclusion section says, quote, the range of forest floor invertebrate population densities reported in the literature is approximately 2 times 10 to the 3rd per meter squared to 8 times 10 to the 5th per meter squared for temperate regions. All of the studies reported here fall within that range, end quote.